Hey, dropout, translate this in an hour. I glanced at the documents handed to me with a mocking laughter. It appeared to be a contract written in French. It might be too hard for you without a college degree, but get it done in less than an hour. Behind those mocking words, I could sense the intent of ridicule, thinking I'd probably fail and wondering how they could make fun of me if I did. The surrounding co-workers watched the exchange with a mix of sympathy and disbelief. Reading such a document would take less than three seconds. As I quickly scanned the content, I was taken aback because it detailed an unbelievable deal. I've skimmed through it, and this contract is just absurd. What? No way you read that so quickly. Facing his raised angry voice, I calmly pointed out the errors in the documents. My name is Sam. I'm a regular office worker at a certain company. Well, starting today, I'll be working at the New York headquarters. Growing up in a poo family, I started working on the ground at this company right after middle school. Back then, it was just a part-time gig, but eventually, I was hired full-time. My co-workers were kind, and despite my limited formal education, they taught me a lot. From the job itself to math and even languages, I learned a lot on the job. I always believed that what I learned would one day benefit the company and contribute to its growth. With that mindset, the company helped shape me into a respectable professional, recognizing my skills and eventually trusting me with an assignment to an overseas branch. Although my first venture abroad presented numerous challenges, it was rewarding, and I was able to build good relationships with the locals. To be honest, I have been offered higher positions multiple times but always declined because I prioritized hands-on work at the branch. It was a decision many people regretted, but they respected my choice and let me proceed how I saw fit. Thanks to that, our overseas branch got on the right track generating stable revenue. And so, I've proudly returned to the New York headquarters. Though my departure was bittersweet for many at the branch, I know they've grown enough to run it on their own. Many came to the airport to bid me farewell, bearing loads of gifts and bouquets. I waved back at them. I am heading back to the States and going to serve as a regular worker at the New York headquarters for a while to get accustomed to working there. I've missed my home country and regard my co-workers like family, so I was eagerly anticipating my return. I gazed out of the airplane window, lost in thought. After a long time away, I was excited about returning to the States and to the impressive new building of headquarters. Starting today, this is my workplace. As I looked around the spacious office, Harry gave a brief introduction about me. The co-workers, many of whom I didn't recognize, greeted me with applause. The only familiar face seems to be Harry. For now, I'll be assigned to the sales department where Harry works to get a grasp of the atmosphere and work routine of the New York headquarters. There's talk about me taking up a significant position later on, but revealing that now might intimidate some co-workers. So, for now, they introduced me as just another co-worker returning from the branch. Starting from today, I look forward to working here. With that greeting, I bowed my head and the co-workers greeted me with warm applause. I thought this was a great workplace. I never imagined that among the young, motivated co-workers, there would be someone with malicious intent. On the first day, I focused on understanding the workflow getting to know clients, and familiarizing myself with ongoing contracts. That's when I was introduced to a young man named James, a graduate from a prestigious university and showing promise as a rookie just a year after joining the company. Nodding in agreement with Harry's words that we both have something to learn from each other, I introduced myself. I'm Sam. Nice to meet you. As I extended my hand for a handshake, after a quick glance, James introduced himself in a somewhat irritated tone. I'm James. Regardless, I was now set to work with James. 
Thinking back, there was a sense of discomfort from the beginning. Sam, right. Keep it your mind that I'm the senior here, after all. Oh, understood. The moment the department had left, his tone and attitude turned curt. However, I figured for a young and talented guy like him, mentoring a middle-aged man sent over from a branch office must seem like a tedious task, so I decided not to let it bother me. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so accepting of his demeanor. For about the first week, I was able to learn the nature of the job by observing James at work. Since he didn't give me any explicit directions, I assumed it was a learn-by-watching kind of situation. But it seems I was mistaken. You're just sitting next to me, collecting a paycheck. Aren't you a little old to be doing that? That day, out of the blue, he dropped that comment, and I was taken aback. I have been diligently taking notes while watching James work, ensuring I understood the workflow. I made it a point to remember all our clients and contract details and was already strategizing about future dealings, but to him, it seemed like I was slacking off. Before I could even explain the misunderstanding, James turned to chat with a passing female co-worker. Where's that coffee going? It's for Harry's office. He has a visitor. From the female co-worker who responded, James quickly took the tray from her. Without even glancing at her puzzled expression, he turned to me and said, You're just hanging around today too, aren't you? Do this simple task. I carefully took the tray, making sure not to spill the coffee. Um, but it's okay. Let's get the guy who's been doing nothing all week to do some work. All right, please take it to the reception room then. The female co-worker, looking troubled, gave a slight bow and James said, no need for that, now get moving. Pushing me along with those words. Though I was confused, it was still a task I had been assigned. If I didn't hurry, I'd end up making the guests wait. Understood. Saying that, I carried the coffee to the reception room. From then on, his arrogant attitude only got worse. He blatantly looked down on me hurling insults my way. I wondered what I had done to upset him. I couldn't recall doing anything to deserve such disdain, leaving me puzzled. Nevertheless, I'm currently in a position to learn under him at work. I had no choice but to endure it. Hey, old man, copy this for me. We need it for the meeting, so make sure you get enough copies for all the members. A stack of papers was thrown carelessly at me. As I bent down to pick up the papers I had dropped, I could hear James's mocking voice. Typical old man, so useless. With just those words, he returned to his desk without another glance in my direction. A sympathetic co-worker tried to help me, but after getting a sharp look from James, he just said, sorry, with a regretful look on his face. Don't worry about it. It's my job. I replied to the kind co-worker while gathering the documents. Afterwards, I made copies for everyone, secured them with paper clips, and made my way to the conference room. You're late. The moment I entered, I was met with a shout. I thought there was still time before the meeting began. Confused, I distributed the documents to the co-workers. The meeting time was moved up. A female co-worker whispered to me. It seemed I hadn't been informed of the change in schedule. Feeling like a small act of malice had pierced my heart, I took my seat. Why are you sitting? You're not part of this meeting, old man. James's sharp voice echoed throughout the conference room. I'd like to understand about the new product. I responded, feeling the situation was completely unfair. At that, James visibly scowled. We're telling you to leave because even if you listen, it won't be of any use. His disgruntled voice drew the attention of everyone in the room. Some looked annoyed, some pitied me, their glances hurt, and I decided that staying would only be a nuisance. I understand. Excuse me. I quietly said that and left the conference room. Behind the door I had softly closed, 
I bit my lip with sadness and frustration. I had returned to the NY headquarters to work. Yet, they wouldn't let me do anything. Still, I'm not in a position to defy James right now. Harry told me to learn from him. I don't want to let him down. If I can't attend the meetings, all I can do is dive deep into the documents, research the details, and understand them. Throughout the hours long meeting, I did what I could in my own way. The new product discussed in the meeting was set to be pitched to a major international company. James is at the center of this project. He's running around various places as if he's forgotten about my existence. Right now, I'm left behind in the office, sorting and processing the expense documents he told me to handle. Occasionally, there are receipts mixed in that shouldn't be processed as expenses, so I discreetly set them aside for later clarification. I plan to ask about the details later. However, for such a big project, I think James is making too many unilateral decisions. Each time he returns, he gives instructions to the co-workers, but he seems to be the only one who knows the detailed status of things. This way, things that need to be done or networking when he's not around can be done. I believe the product is being manufactured in a factory, but as he checked on its operation status. Looking around, many co-workers seem unsure about what to do next, their hands idle. What should I do? While I'm pondering this, James returns. His face is flushed, filled with elation. Walking back with great pride, he approaches me with a smug look on his face. Hey old dropout, translate this in an hour. I glanced at the documents handed to me with a mocking laughter. It appeared to be a contract written in French. It might be too hard for you without a college degree, but get it done in less than an hour. I called out to James as he was about to walk away. Hold on, this is a contract for a new product, right? Yeah, so what? I responded to his scoffing remark. I've skimmed through it, and this contract is just absurd. What? No way you read that so quickly. Facing his raised angry voice, I calmly pointed out the errors in the documents. First, the amount listed here is off. The contract itself is simple enough that anyone could read it in a few seconds. I began by reading out the contract quickly. Not just James, but the other co-workers also looked at me in surprise. The wording seems fine, but this is in Euro notation. What? What are you talking about? That can't be right. James snatched the contract from me and took another hard look at it. He was visibly shaken by the amount listed. The fact that the amount was sneakily written in small, messy handwriting suggests that the other company is definitely shady. Still, if one were to carefully check, it would be obvious. To begin with, it's clear they're taking us lightly if they think they can pull something like this. Thankfully, the contract hasn't been finalized yet. There's still a chance to fix things. Can someone please call Harry as soon as possible? Whoa, old man, don't go making decisions on your own. I glance at the shouting James and quickly think about my next move. James, the contract mentions that we need to provide samples before the deal, right? Yay, that's right. It's a big deal. That's standard procedure. Have you informed the factory about this? At my words, James hesitated. Most likely, the factory wasn't informed about the sample provision. Come on, even without saying, we surely have some samples ready, don't we? We can't be sure of how many surplus units we have without checking with the factory. I immediately make a call to the factory. The workers there, surprised by the urgent call from the NY headquarters, promptly connect me to the factory manager who fortunately was nearby. I quickly brief him on the current situation and check how many samples we can provide. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to meet the numbers our client had specified. I know it's a stretch, but can we ramp up production to meet the deadline? For you, Sam, we'll make it work. Don't sweat it. 
the factory manager was willing to cooperate. I felt sorry, but it seemed like we would have to ask the workers for some overtime. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I sent my deepest gratitude to them. Sam, what on earth happened? Harry arrived, and James, pale-faced, pleaded with the director. Director, this guy, he messed with my contract. Everyone present knew that James was the one who initially brought the contract. He probably wasn't aware of the nonsense he was spouting. However, it was clear he was trying to pin his mistake on me. This realization made me profoundly sad. Harry, there were discrepancies in the contract. Here's the translated version. Upon reading the document I handed over, his face changed. If we went through with this deal, our company would suffer immense losses. We haven't finalized the deal yet. I'll contact the client. Hua, what do you think you're doing? It's my contract. I'll make the call. James, keep quiet for a moment. Harry sternly interrupted James. Sam, can I trust you with this? Of course, you can. Harry's words, filled with trust, made me nod in agreement. I immediately contacted the client. As I began conversing fluently in French, everyone in the office stared at me in surprise. However, I couldn't be concerned with that now. Time was of the essence. I've secured an appointment. I'll head over to their office right away. I'll accompany you. We quickly tidied ourselves up and began preparations to head to the client's office. If, if that's the case, I'll, I'll go too. James tried to persist, but Harry gave him a cold stare. Do you even comprehend the gravity of what you've done? I, I, James was at a loss for words, and I said nothing. Now was not the time for that. Leaving a visibly exhausted James behind, we left the office. As a result, we successfully negotiated with the client and managed to make a deal that satisfied both parties. At first, they seemed to look down on us, but when I began speaking in their language, they quickly changed their attitude and engaged in a balanced conversation. It seems they never intended to act so unscrupulously from the beginning. They realized there was an oversight in the contract and mentioned how relieved they were that a competent representative came to rectify it. Apparently, James's French was hard to understand and, to make matters worse, rather self-absorbed. While we do conduct our transactions in English, it's not their native language. That's precisely why one must be cautious with pronunciation and word choice. James's way of speaking lacks sincerity. This, combined with other issues, frustrated them, and they thought of slightly intimidating us. They didn't expect us to take such a contract seriously and actually consider it. At the same time, they had intended to sever ties with any company willing to finalize such an agreement carelessly. Our newbie, James, was rude, but you guys were also out of line. Upon hearing this, the executives from the client side gave her a smile and apologized for testing us. Moving forward, I believe we can engage in mutually beneficial transactions. After that, we shook hands, had a friendly chat, and then returned to the New York headquarters. I returned to the New York headquarters and entered the office, which was still buzzing with an ease. Soon, flustered co-workers rushed over to me. The contract has been amended to the appropriate amount and will provide the sample products as promised, I informed them. Upon sharing that the director and I had renegotiated the deal, ensuring a positive business relationship in the future, the co-workers collectively sighed in relief and celebrated the good news. Amidst the jubilation, a young man stood alone, glaring at me. It was James. What the hell, man? You stole my thunder. Cold stares surrounded the yelling James. James, do you realize how much trouble you've caused everyone this time? As I questioned him calmly, it seemed to strike a nerve, and he started ranting like a tantruming child. Why should I care? If everyone had listened to me, everything would have gone smoothly. 
I did nothing wrong. Everything would have been fine without your meddling. I'm not at fault. Definitely not at fault. With each of his outbursts, the atmosphere grew colder. And it seems my patience had reached its limit. Enough is enough. My voice echoed throughout the office. You should be ashamed, being an adult and not being able to accept your own mistakes. Quietly, yet with stern authority, I addressed him. James stood there, lost for words. The co-workers just stared at me with shock, while Harry gave her a smile. This could have been avoided if you haven't acted on your own. There's nobody else here competent enough except me. No one paid heed to James's lone outburst. Why is it always me who's in the wrong, and you old man is always right? My name is Sam, so do not call me old man. I replied firmly. You've never once called me by my name, have you? Why would I? Someone like you doesn't deserve that kind of respect. Seeing James refuse to accept his mistakes to the very end made me sad. James, Sam here, has been instrumental in setting up our overseas branches and has been a pillar of support for 10 years. But, he's just a guy without a college degree. It's true I didn't graduate from college, but ever since then, I've dedicated my life to this company. At the words of both Harry and me, everyone in the office, including James, was speechless. He's in a completely different league than you, both in skills and experience. I hoped you would learn from Sam. I was mistaken. The words from Harry, clearly expressing his disappointment, left James utterly deflated. After that, I no longer saw James around the office. He wasn't fired. The company tried to let him go, but I intervened. Though arrogant and self-centered, he's still young. He should have the chance to start over. Now, he's working at a factory as a regular worker on the floor. I wanted him to get to know the ground level, to understand the products and the people making them, and then figure out what he should be doing. Some said I was being lenient, but I disagree. For someone as proud as him, working on the factory floor would be a humbling experience. I thought this would be the best lesson for him. He might not be able to do even half of what the workers he looked down upon can do. Through this, I hope he learns. It's because of these supportive workers that we can do our jobs. Being nurtured by this company, I don't want to abandon him. I hope he bounces back from this setback and someday we can work side by side. That's my wish. Months have passed since then, and work has been running smoothly. As for me, I've been promoted to sales department director. Harry is now an executive vice president. My relationships with the co-workers are strong, and we have a solid partnership with the clients, even the ones we had the contract issues with. Looking back, this company saved my life. And now, I'm back at the New York headquarters supporting the company as one of its pillars. I'm liaising with our overseas branches and we're making progress with new product development. The fruits of my labor over the years are finally paying off. I couldn't be happier. I will continue to grow alongside this company. I watered the small cactus on my desk before heading to a meeting. By the time I returned, the cactus had blossomed with a tiny flower. The woman I met at a group blind date was a female doctor who was expected by everyone around her. However, inexperienced and lacking in confidence, she is unable to move her body on the spur of the moment. Being a doctor myself, I decided to step in and assist so she wouldn't disappoint her friends. My name's Jack, a 32-year-old ER doctor. Even at this age, I've never been the topic of gossip. Sure, I've had relationships, but prioritizing work over everything led to many breakups, with most of my exes complaining I didn't give them enough attention. I realized in my late 20s that maybe I'm more cut out for work than romance. In the beginning, there was some emptiness amidst the rush of marriages and births around me, 
but now I am able to completely separate myself and struggle daily with work and study in order to save as many patients as possible. My family back home is pretty laid back, so no one really pressures me about marriage. Feeling thankful for the blessed environment I was in, all I could think about was becoming self-sufficient as soon as possible. An old high school buddy of mine invited me to a mixer. To be honest, I wasn't interested and was going to decline, but they were one person short and pleaded for my help, so I reluctantly agreed. It was just a filler spot for their group date, so I planned to make a short appearance and then leave. I left my house without dressing up and headed to the meetup spot. Hey everyone, long time no see. It seemed I was the last to arrive, and seeing old friends after so long put a smile on my face. Becoming an adult meant not seeing these friends as often, so reuniting with them at this group date was a pleasant surprise. Even though I wasn't keen on going initially, that moment of reunion made me glad I came. We caught up with each other with old stories and updates on the way to the restaurant, and it felt like we were back in our college days. I was having such a good time, I almost forgot the main purpose was the group date. We were seated and waited a few minutes for the women to arrive. The men suddenly tensed up as the women entered with a cheerful nice to meet you. Recalling the silent prayers my friends whispered, hoping for a meaningful encounter as we entered the restaurant, I couldn't help but silently cheer them on. After ordering drinks and making a toast, we started introducing ourselves. I'm Jack. I work in corporate. I had made a prior arrangement with my friends to introduce myself with a different profession. It's not that I'm embarrassed, but explaining I'm a doctor often leads to many questions, and it can be tedious. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work as an internal medicine doctor. I was taken aback to hear that amongst us was a fellow doctor. The seemingly reserved woman ordered a non-alcoholic drink and had her cell phone face up on the table. I also kept my phone out in a similar manner, always on alert for emergency calls, so I could tell that Sarah wasn't lying when she said she's a doctor. My buddies would tell me, come on, have a drink for once, but I just smiled and brushed it off. The moment Sarah mentioned she was a doctor, she became the center of attention, getting bombarded with questions. I'm just a nervous in name only. She answered, looking modest or perhaps a bit apologetic. Yet, Sarah's friends seemed proud to have a doctor in their group, boasting about her as if parents would about their child's profession. I'm a doctor too, but I don't yet feel confident in my abilities, so I often avoid mentioning it in front of strangers. Sarah must have an honest and straightforward personality. I felt a tad sympathetic watching her be praised by her friends for being a female doctor and seeing her respond with a troubled smile. My buddies seemed to be growing fond of Sarah, their gaze fixated on her. Anyone could tell Sarah was beautiful, kind, and gave off a delicate vibe. And her humble demeanor probably made her even more likable. I wasn't drawn to her romantically, but I felt a kinship with her as a fellow doctor. Many female doctors at my workplace were strong-willed, had a high society vibe, and were quite snobbish. My alma mater was a state university in a place like Idaho, but my current hospital is affiliated with a private medical college, so there are many young female doctors. Hearing their conversations, there are a lot of things I don't quite understand. Their values clearly clash with mine, and coming from an average family, I often feel out of place. I've always had difficulty connecting with such women. I sensed none of that vibe from Sarah in front of me. As the night went on and we all loosened up with some drinks, the ambience in the bar suddenly shifted. Sir, are you okay? The distressed call of the store clerk, followed by the sight of a fallen man just beyond the open door. I immediately stood up and approached the man. I informed the clerk that I'm a doctor and diagnosed him with acute alcohol poisoning, instructing her to call an ambulance. From behind, Sarah, pushed forward by our mixer friends, came toward us, visibly shaken. Um, I mean, 
clearly not accustomed to such situations. Her hands trembled, taking too long to decide and seemingly on the verge of panicking. I reassured Sarah, it's okay. I'm actually an emergency doctor. I've been through this many times. Stay calm. Let's first get him into a more comfortable position. I whispered that softly to her. Though surprised, Sarah nodded and followed my directions, turning the man to a safer position. Making sure his clothing wasn't restricting him, I asked the clerk for a blanket to keep him warm. Fortunately, he was still breathing. Basic first aid seemed to suffice as we awaited the ambulance. No matter how many times you face emergencies outside the hospital, you never really get used to it. Thankfully, it wasn't more serious. Looking down with regret, Sarah replied, I couldn't do anything, tears streaming silently. Earlier at the mixer, she had shared that she's working at a big city hospital. Judging by her age, it seemed she had limited experience. She had graduated top of her class and it seemed everyone had high expectations of her because of it. Earlier, Sarah had said, struggling, I can't let everyone down, saving lives but feeling the need to constantly meet others' expectations. I think that's wrong. But I also understand that it's not solely Sarah's fault that she feels this way. I don't care about titles and rarely talk about my profession. Perhaps because of that, People even say things like, oh, right, Jack was a doctor too. They even made such rude remarks. The contrast between me and Sarah. But seeing her cry out of frustration, it moved me too. I remember having a time like that myself, and I knew firsthand just how painful that kind of regret can be. Sarah, you're really something. After the man was taken away in an ambulance, Sarah hesitantly began to speak to the friends who had rushed over. I didn't really. Thanks to your precise instructions, he was saved. She was about to say she hadn't done anything, and I interrupted her and looked up to meet the surprised eyes of Sarah. Her friends were hugging her, saying, you did great. Sarah looked at me as if asking why, but I figured she just didn't want to let her friends down. From Sarah's bag, a medical reference book was peeking out. Despite being a newly published edition, it was tattered and full of sticky notes. She must be putting in an immeasurable amount of effort. It might just be me being pretentious, but hard work is always rewarded. That's why I hope she doesn't get disheartened now. There will be many more setbacks in the future. But I thought that right now, she doesn't need to bear the guilt of letting her friends down. And the mixer ended after the incidents during the first round. I was relieved I didn't have to think of an excuse for not attending the second round, as I was about to head home with other things on my mind. A dimmed looking Sarah approached me, saying, Jack, please wait. When I asked her what was up, she bowed and thanked me. Would you mind sharing your contact information? I'd like to stay connected both as friends and fellow doctors. She offered her phone, looking expectant, and I couldn't help but find her endearing. Here's my number. Thank you. When I displayed my number, Sarah registered it with a happy look. After exchanging contact information, she waved and went back to join her group of friends. The ladies were planning a sleepover and mentioned they were heading out for some shopping. My buddies and I decided to hit a bar we know and have another drink. Being the usual non-drinker, I was sober and stared at my phone screen. I received a message from Sarah. She simply said, thank you. I replied simply, you're welcome, and hit send. It seemed that Sarah wasn't great at communication either. That was the end of our message exchange for the moment. Afterwards, we exchanged messages a few times a week, sharing trivial things like how beautiful the sky looked today or that a flower she was growing had bloomed. In our exchanges, we never made plans to go out, but rather shared random thoughts, forming an oddly comfortable bond. Still, I found our little chats comforting. We both have a lot to learn. We're both busy anyway, 
both of us needing to practice and learn from experience. Too much communication can be draining. From time to time, I looked forward to messages from Sarah like, let's keep it up or good job today. I realized I had feelings for her six months after we first met. Sarah was driven by her past experiences, always studying and attending various trainings to become a doctor who can save lives under any circumstances. I had busy days juggling work and studies too, but I always made sure to get enough sleep and took breaks when I needed to. Sarah, always being so hard on herself, seemed to push through without taking much time to rest. Every now and then, when she'd call and share how she had learned something new, I'd feel genuinely impressed and wanted to support her. It's tough, but it's fun. I feel like I'm finally on my path and I want to become better every day. Hearing her laugh while saying those words, I was sure of my feelings for her. I think I had these feelings for a while, but it took me some time to recognize them. Finally acknowledging my feelings, I decided to ask Sarah out. Sarah, when's your next day off? Next Thursday. Luckily, our days off mashed, so I smoothly brought up the idea of a date. She happily accepted, and I began planning our date. We'd exchanged messages and calls but hadn't met since the day of our initial encounter. Our second meeting in total. But I had decided that on this date, I'd confess my feelings. I knew we both had busy schedules, and it was uncertain when we can meet next. To make my confession successful, I needed the perfect date plan. Then, one night while on duty, an emergency case came in. I quickly assessed the situation, giving directions to the nurse, and rushed to the emergency entrance. The ambulance arrived, and the emergency patient was brought out. With the patient was Sarah, her white knit stained with blood. A man in his 30s collided with an oncoming vehicle while riding his motorcycle. He was unconscious and in critical condition, so we administered CPR and applied emergency bleeding control. While pushing the stretcher together, Sarah explained the situation and the actions taken. I understand. I'll take it from here. I immediately went into the treatment room and hurriedly administered care. Cleaning and stitching the wound, ensuring no damage to the brain. After contacting the patient's family, I finished the treatment. Thanks to the excellent first aid provided, though the injuries were visible, they weren't critical. When I left the treatment room, waiting there was Sarah. The first aid treatment you gave was perfect and really helped the patient. The patient's life is in no danger. I said, bowing my head in gratitude. Seemingly relieved, Sarah slumped down, saying, I'm so glad, and tears of relief flowed. After work, I went shopping and saw an accident outside the supermarket. I didn't know what to do at first, but before I realized it, my body just moved on its own. She was scared, but she said she had been reminding herself of why she had been training all this time. It took great courage for her to identify herself as a doctor. She said if she hadn't stepped in, perhaps nobody else would have. I'm aware of how hard Sarah has worked up to this point. You did well, Sarah. I gently patted her head. Comforted, she nodded, tears streaming down her face. Sarah, it's getting late, but I'm almost done with work. Would you like to grab some food? There's a diner nearby that's open till morning. Suggesting a meal after work, I invited Sarah. I'd love to, actually. I haven't even had dinner yet. Sarah replied immediately, mentioning she had been hungry for a while. She looked embarrassed, holding her stomach, and said she would change out of her blood-stained sweater. She grabbed a bag with spare clothes she happened to have and dashed to the restroom. Watching her run, she seemed more dependable than before. It's hard to imagine, especially when thinking about that day when she was so nervous trying to meet her friend's expectations. Perhaps she's slowly gaining confidence in her medical profession. I threw her a good job as she disappeared from sight. After wrapping up work, I met Sarah sitting at the lobby, 
and we headed to a nearby diner. We walked in and took our seats to pick from the menu. I ordered grilled chicken, while Sarah opted for steak and potatoes. Sarah's eyes sparkled as she happily ate the food that arrived shortly afterwards. This place is amazing. Seeing her so pleased, I was glad I brought her here. Before I realized, I was confessing my feelings to her. Sarah, I like you. Huh, uh, well, she stopped eating, taken aback by the sudden confession. Originally, I had planned to confess during our planned date, a perfect setting I had in mind. I was equally startled, wondering why I had blurted it out now. But what's said is said. Now I had to convey my true feelings. I admire your hard work, how you always give your best toward your goals, even the casual texts or the trivial phone calls, I cherish them all. When I told her that Sarah's hard work had saved me many times, she looked down with a blushed face. This is only our second time meeting, but would you like to date me? I stood up and reached out my hand. Hesitantly, Sarah took it. I managed to keep going because of you, Jack. That day, I felt so helpless, yet you helped ensure I didn't let my friend down. I was relieved, but also felt pathetic. But I managed to pull through because of you, even though I can't express it well. She said, taking a deep breath, squeezing my hand tighter. I could feel the intensity of her emotions through her firm grip. To be honest, no words were needed. I could sense the depth of her feelings. So, I like you too, Jack. If you're okay with someone like me, I'd be grateful. A humble attitude that has not changed since we met. It's so like Sarah, and my affection for her only grows. And just like that, during our second meal together, our relationship began. Despite our busy schedules, we made time for each other, going on numerous dates. Sarah always said she needed more experience and knowledge, pushing herself harder every day. Inspired by her, I've been attending more training sessions and studying every day. I was worried I might make her feel lonely like in my past relationships, but surprisingly, Sarah isn't the type to feel left out easily. We've had a smooth relationship for two years now. Even with our busy lives, Sarah is always by my side. The confession plan I had in mind that day didn't work out, but unexpectedly, we ended up being mutually in love. Now, Sarah and I are married and living together. Sarah is expecting a child, adding more joy to our future. Both of us, with our undying passion for our careers, continue to push and inspire each other every day. After her maternity leave, Sarah is considering switching from internal medicine to emergency medicine. I used to immerse myself in work, thinking I wasn't cut out for love, but now, meeting someone with whom I can share happiness and grow together feels like the greatest blessing in life. I'm determined to work hard to protect this happiness in the future.